Hello everyone, it is a pleasure to welcome you all this evening, or perhaps I should say this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from the world today. Before we begin, um, I need to tell you that this uh, webinar is going to be recorded, but don't worry, um, only myself and the other panellists will be visible in that video, um, so don't worry about what you're doing. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you have been able to join us this evening or morning or afternoon on this webinar on the Global Church and the Fossil Fueled Five. My name is Tash. I am a member of the Young Christian Climate Network, YCCN, and I'm currently a PhD student at King's College London. And previously, before my PhD, I was the mobilisation coordinator for YCCN's Relay to COP26. It's wonderful to welcome you all as we pre prepare to hear from inspiring leaders from churches and civil society groups from across the world who will share their insights about the steps that churches and faith institutions are taking and still need to take on fossil fuel divestment and to hold our governments accountable on these issues, especially through support for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Our webinar this evening takes inspiration from the Fossil Fueled 5 report, published during COP26 by the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. It examines five wealthy nations, the UK, the US, Canada, Australia and Norway, who have all got widening gaps between their rhetoric on climate action and their current plans to expand fossil fuel production. Wherever you are joining us from today, this webinar will provide an excellent opportunity to find out how you can get involved in campaigning for divestment in your church or faith institution at a local, regional or national level and support the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Our speakers will be sharing their experiences and insights, which will be followed by a call to action led by Cameron Conant, Operation Noah's communications officer and Jamara Asavado from Ladato Sea Movement. There will be an engaging Q&A panel where you'll also have the chance to ask our speakers your questions. If you do have a question that you would like to ask, please write them in the Q&A box, which you'll find on the icon bar at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can also upvote questions that you would like to hear answered as well, so please do that. You have all been automatically muted as you've joined this event. So you'll only be able to see and hear the webinar speakers in speak of you when they come to speak. However, the Q&A box will be available to you throughout the webinar to post your questions as well as the chat box. Finally, please do post on social media during this webinar. And when you do so, please make sure to use the hashtags hashtag Global Church Divest and hashtag Fossil Fuel Treaty, which will pop in the chat for you this evening. That's enough from me. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this evening, Bill McKibben. Bill is an American environmentalist, author and journalist who has written extensively on the impact of global heating. He is the Schumann Distinguished Scholar at Middlebury College and co-founder of the climate campaign group 350.org. His work appears regularly in periodicals from The New Yorker to Rolling Stone. Bill is also the founder of Third Act, which organises people over the age of 60 on climate um, to take action on climate and justice. Bill, let me pass over to you. What, what a pleasure to be with you all, Tash. Thank you for that kind introduction. And as you point out, if you're from the uh, Young Christian Climate Network, I'm from the Ancient Christian Climate Network, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, since I'm going first here, I'm just going to set the scene for a minute about where we stand right now in this debate, because that will help us uh, figure out what we need to be doing, how fast and on what scale. And I'm afraid the answer is we need to be moving very fast and on an enormous scale because we are very far behind. I wrote the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect back in 1989, a book called The End of Nature. And so I've been in involved in this work about as long as it's possible to have been involved in it. And I will tell you that the things that we worried about 30 years ago are precisely the things that we now see in the headlines every day. Um, none of it is unexpected, 
All of it is brutal. And this year is the perfect example. We've seen, among other things, truly, truly striking heat waves across the uh, Indian subcontinent for much of the spring. The temperature has been up in American Fahrenheit terms hovering in the 110, 115, day after day after day after day, people unable to cool off at night, um, um, lives disrupted in the most profound, sad, and quiet ways. It's not as noisy as the other huge impacts we see now daily, the giant forest fires that have begun to burn, among other things, far north in um, the Siberian tundra where they're producing now huge clouds of carbon, the inexorable rise of the oceans that now is clearly underway, the other disruptions, uh, the huge storms, the flooding rains, um, all of it's extremely painful and all of it is multiplying rapidly. What we've seen so far, the melt, for instance, of most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic is what happens when you raise the temperature of the earth one degree Celsius. We're on our way to raising it three degrees Celsius at the moment. All the work that we're talking about today is not to stop global warming. Sadly, it's much too late for that. It's to try and hold it to someplace 1.5, 2 degrees, where it doesn't cut civilization off at the knees. And that's going to be a close call. Not only do we understand the climate impacts, we understand much more than we used to the public health impacts of burning the fossil fuel that creates the climate change. Even without heating the planet, we know from a huge study last year that it's killing 9 million people a year from breathing the combustion byproducts of that coal and gas and oil. That's more than COVID, HIV, AIDS, malaria, TB, war, and terrorism combined. <clears throat> and now, this year, we're reminded once again of the extraordinary other danger of fossil fuel that it is commonly and powerfully associated with autocracy and hence with the um, dangers that that presents. You're going to hear from my great colleague and friends, Lana Romanko, in a little while. We've been back and forth in the much this spring as she's doing amazing work in the Ukraine. But what she keeps saying is fossil fuel is a weapon of mass destruction because it exists in a few places on the planet. And the people who happen to exercise power in those places, Vladimir Putin being the perfect example, get unearned power precisely from their control of those resources. It's, um, well, uh, uh, it, it, it's the third reason and, um, and a powerful one to want to move quickly to energy that comes not from hell, but from heaven, uh, to move off coal and gas and oil and instead rely on the fact that the good Lord was kind enough to put a big ball of burning gas 93 million miles away in the sky, um, which we now have the wit to make full use of. I wrote a piece earlier this year in The New Yorker saying that it's entirely possible now to imagine the 200,000 year human career of setting stuff on fire coming to an abrupt end. We don't need to be doing it anymore <clears throat> because we can capture the rays of the sun and the wind that they create through differential heating. And we can store that in batteries and we can use that electricity to power the things that we need to do. You no longer need to have a small fire burning under the hood of your car or in your kitchen to cook your food or in your basement to heat your home. It's not only possible to do these things, it would be the cheapest way to do them. A massive study from Oxford last year demonstrated that a rapid transition to renewable energy would save the world tens of trillions of dollars simply because we wouldn't have to always keep paying for another boatload of coal or gas or oil. So if we face the biggest problem the world has ever faced, and climate change is an order of magnitude larger than any other problem we've ever come across on this world. And we have a set of solutions that would allow us to begin addressing it in powerful ways. The obvious question is why we're not employing them. And the reason, of course, is this toxic combination of inertia and vested interest that's kept us locked in place decade after decade, not doing what we need to do. 
In my country, being the prime example and the biggest offender, you need look no further than the man, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who's holding up the first climate bill that the US Congress has ever tried to pass. Uh, Joe Manchin has taken more money from the fossil fuel industry than any other person in Washington. Not an easy contest to win, but he won it. And their return on investment for those campaign contributions is amazing because it's holding up hundreds of billions of dollars of desperately needed money to get this transition fully underway. So in order to stand up to these guys, in order to make the change that we need, we need to loosen the grip of the fossil fuel industry on public policy the world around. There are lots of ways of doing that. One is the very important fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty that my friend Zipporah is going to tell you more about in a little while. And it really is a powerful idea and one whose time has come. In order to get it passed and in order to get any of these things done, we're going to need to weaken the political power of this industry. And one way to do that is to weaken their financial power. That's why it's been so important that everybody has joined together in this fossil fuel divestment campaign over the last decade. Uh, when it started, we had no idea where it would go. It's become the biggest corporate campaign of its kind in history. We're now at $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. One reason we got that far is because of Pope Francis's straightforward demand that we stop trying to profit off the end of the world. Uh, the Laudato Si movement that his encyclical engendered is one of the most promising things we have ever seen. But we need much more. We need many, many more people standing up standing up to the fossil fuel industry, standing up to the banks that fund them and the insurance companies that underwrite them. This work is underway all kinds of places. Young people as usual are leading this work. You all know about, uh, well, the college students that I founded 350.org with or the young people in America who brought us the Sunrise Movement or of course, the millions and millions of people, young people, junior high and high school students around the world following the lead of Greta Thunberg and all her compatriots. That's wonderful, but it's not fair or practical to demand that 17 year olds solve the worst problems the world's ever faced alone. Not okay to say in between you know, algebra homework and field hockey practice, would you mind also saving the earth? Um, that's why everybody else needs to back them up. And everybody else in this case means particularly people of faith who have obvious reasons. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm no theologian. You'll hear from some great ones. I've never risen higher in the ecclesial hierarchy than Methodist Sunday school teacher. But even I've, you know, know that you don't need to be a great theological genius. The very first page of the book, which is probably the page more people read than others, um, tells us straight out that our job is to protect this beautiful creation that God gave us, a job we are failing at miserably. We run creation in reverse now. We're, we're, Genesis is going backwards. And our job is to stand up to that and stand up to it now. So those of us especially who've been around a long time, and if you're 60, you've seen 85% of the world's carbon emissions pour into the atmosphere in the course of your lifetime. We need to back people up and back people up hard and fast in order to make change. This is a time test, unlike every other political challenge we face. If we don't solve it soon, then we never solve it. No one has a plan for freezing the Arctic back up. That's why it is so powerful to see the people on this call and to understand that they represent the hopes, the heartfelt hopes and the literal prayers hundreds and hundreds of millions of people of faith the world over. This is the task of our lifetime. We have a very little time to solve it. It's a great honor to get to be in that fight with everybody here, with everybody listening, and with all the people that you will now reach out to and get to join in this most important, most important of campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. What a fantastic call for action uh, to start us off in this webinar. Our next speaker for this evening is Zipporah Berman. 
Zipporah has been working on environmental policy and campaigns in Canada and beyond for over 30 years. She is currently the International Programme Director at Stand Earth and the Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. Zipporah is also the co-founder of the Global Oil and Gas Network and former co-director of Greenpeace International's Climate and Energy Programme. Zipporah, please may I pass over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, having me uh, at this important gathering uh, this evening. Um, I want to uh, share my screen uh, just so that I can introduce you to why uh, we started the Fossil Fuel Treaty, the logic behind it for all of you, I hope, around the world who are going to be joining us to work on the treaty, um, but also give you a sense uh, of the momentum behind it and introduce you to our research uh, that we released at COP26 on the Fossil Fuel 5. So I just wanna make sure that you can see that, is that good? Fantastic. So uh, the, the Fossil Fuel Treaty, of course, uh, starts from the premise as Bill so eloquently laid out, um, that we need bold and immediate action uh, to address the climate emergency. And I think uh, all of us here uh, know that. What's been fascinating to me as I started to really work on fossil fuel supply and try and understand it from the perspective of my home country, uh, Canada, I started working on tar sands and pipelines many years ago now, about 15 years ago. And, and it was fascinating to me how my own government uh, really thought that they weren't responsible for constraining fossil fuel production at all, only emissions. You know, the governments constrain emissions and set targets on emissions. And, you know, and the markets, well, the markets will constrain supply is the mantra that we, we, we frequently hear. And I realized as I started working on this and, and then later as I started working on um, with indigenous nations in the Amazon to stop oil drilling in the Amazon and in other countries, that in every country we're hearing the same mantra. So climate policy is complicated. Uh, it's true. And the solutions are complicated. But what's not complicated is that 86% of the emissions that are trapped in our atmosphere today and smothering the earth, uh, causing the extreme weather and the fires and the floods uh, and the heat waves that are sweeping our planet come from three products, oil, gas, and coal, 86%. And we're currently on track, which we know as a result of the United Nations Environmental Program and Stockholm Environmental Institute and other organizations creating the production gap report a couple of years ago, that we're on track to produce about 110% more fossil fuels, more oil and gas right now by 2030 than the world can ever burn and meet the goals uh, of, of the Paris Agreement. So in fact, even uh, today, if we just look at current and existing projects that are already under construction or producing, uh, we are, if the, if the uh, carbon embedded in oil, gas, and coal were burned, it would take us well beyond uh, the 1.5 degree budget. The good news actually embedded in that is that we already have enough. We have enough fossil fuels already under production or construction to use while we transition to cleaner and safer energy systems. We don't need more. Yet every day we hear our governments announce new projects my own government in Canada just recently approved a new offshore drilling off the east coast of Canada, a massive new project in, uh, called Bay de Nord. So all of this learnings really forced us to start looking at how are we doing? You know, we hear of all the time these good news stories about how the price of renewables are dropping, um, how there's uh, the price of battery storages are dropping, and that's true. Well, then how are we doing? 10 years ago, 80% of the energy that was used on the planet came from fossil fuels. Today, 80% of the energy that is used on the planet comes from fossil fuels, and we're just continuing to dig up more and more and more. So what are we doing about it? I'll never forget the day that I searched the Paris Agreement. I wanted to understand what regulations exist in international agreements to constrain the production side of fossil fuels. And the Paris Agreement, I found out, didn't even include the words oil, gas, coal, or fossil fuels. 
So we need new ideas, new international cooperation, new global governance in order to constrain the production side of fossil fuels in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. The fossil fuel treaty is not, is not saying that we need to replace the Paris Agreement. We need international cooperation to stop the expansion of oil, gas, and coal and figure out who gets to produce and where a, a, a system based on equity and fairness uh, that in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, to complement uh, the Paris Agreement. So if we don't have a new global agreement on, 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 on fossil fuels, what happens? Yes, the markets will actually constrain some fossil fuels if they're not distorted by subsidies. And of course, right now, the IMF notes that we have about $11 million a minute going from governments to the big oil and gas companies in subsidies, which is really distorting the markets. But if, if, if we don't have a global agreement, what we'll see is the transition will be harder. We continue to build these projects that then could become stranded assets. It means that it increases the risk to workers. The fossil fuel treaty doesn't threaten uh, energy access in the global south or workers who currently work on fossil fuels. In fact, what we're calling for is a plan. We're calling for a plan to transition, a plan to transition that has justice and equity at its core. And if we have those new types of bilateral and multilateral agreements to, because no country wants to do it alone, then, then that will enable us to ensure that no worker or their family are left behind. So if we don't, it delays renewable energy expansion. It delays the necessary economic diversification and it locks in not just new fossil fuel infrastructure, but it locks in the political power of the fossil fuel industry. It means that it will take us longer to ensure the transition. Pretty frequently I hear from governments, but the transition is happening. You have to be patient. I think it's very difficult to tell the many people around the world who are currently in crisis that they have to be patient. But the fact is it's not a transition if we're continuing to grow the problem. And that's what new oil, gas and coal projects are. So the fossil fuel treaty concept is based on three pillars. First, non-proliferation. Like with nuclear uh, weapons, we have to stop expanding the stockpile of these weapons of mass destruction. We have to stop expansion. So the first pillar is around how do we do that? How do we stop expansion? Secondly, we have to ensure a fair phase out to reduce the existing threat. And of course, the third pillar is we need a just transition. We need to accelerate the transition. And in order to do that, we must have global cooperation because what's happening in different countries is, is of course extremely different. There are some countries where a huge percentage of their GDP is, is coming from fossil fuel expansion. There are countries around the world that are just drilling for more oil now, like Ecuador in the heart of the Amazon, just to feed their debt. So in order to address that, you can't expect countries to be able to do this on their own. We need international cooperation to address those issues so that we have a fair process. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to change the global norm around fossil fuels from one that many of us have grown up with around prosperity to being recognized as being a threat to our future, our economic stability, uh, our physical stability, our climate stability. We're trying to provide the missing mechanisms for multilateral agreement and grow the global movement so we're greater than the sum of our parts. Yes, we need financial campaigns. We need divestment campaigns. But in this moment in history, we cannot let governments off the hook. So with one demand to governments around the world, to say the words that they've been avoiding saying in the Paris Agreement and in all of their speeches, to call out fossil fuels and announce that they will work together to stop the expansion of fossil fuels. That will, is creating a global movement of environmental organization, of indigenous organizations, of faith organizations and leadership from around the world, peace and security and women and cities. A big part of our campaign is to call cities and states who are less influenced by the fossil fuel industry and have played historically an enormous role in helping achieve other great treaties, nuclear or landmines or chemical weapons. Um, we want to increase the transparency and the research and that's where the fossil fuel five work comes in. 
So we produce research and reports that will help the world wrap their head around who's producing and, and what, and what are our challenges at the Fossil Fuel Treaty Initiative. At COP26, we produced the Fossil 5 report. The reason we did this is that it's very clear from the research to date, especially on equity, that wealthy countries have to act first. It's also very clear from our research that it's countries like Canada and the United States where the majority of expansion is planned. In fact, the far majority of oil and gas expansion planned in the next five and 10 years is in the United States. So when people talk about, well, we need to expand fossil fuels in order to turn the lights on in Africa and ensure energy access, we need to recognize that actually the majority of expansion, the majority of profits are actually in the global north. Canada plans to increase it. In fact, this was before Bay de Nord, 17% of its oil expansion, 18% of its gas expansion. The US, again, uh, uh, is responsible for 20% of historical emissions and planning uh, uh, to light the fuse, as many of you would have seen in the, the Guardian work uh, and the, the work of the incredible initiative, the carbon bomb, to light the fuse to one of the largest carbon bombs on the planet in the Permian Basin and dramatically expand uh, oil and gas. The United Kingdom. Uh, still planning on producing more and more oil drilling uh, in the North Sea and, and 30 billion pledged in support of new fossil fuel uh, production. Uh, Norway, again, new projects still on the books. Um, and of course, right now, oil and gas is nearly half of the total value of Norwegian uh, exports. And Australia. The world's largest right now uh, gas exporter, second world's largest of coal. Um, and again, well, we'll see maybe with the new election, there is hope, um, uh, but uh, significant expansion of fossil fuels planned. So where are we today? I wanna wrap up uh, with some hope because I've been working as uh, Bill said, um, many of us have been working on this for a very long time. And the thing I love about the fossil fuel treaty campaign and working on it with all of you is that uh, we have uh, constantly um, this incredible flood of good news of more and more people joining. Um, so in, we now have over 1,300 civil society organizations that have joined the call for the fossil fuel treaty. We have 2,750 scientists and academics 230 nationally elected parliamentarians uh, from I think over 60 countries who have joined the call for a fossil free future, an amazing initiative led by parliamentarians in the global south calling for a fossil fuel future. 101 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama and 50 cities that have passed motions at city councils now, um, 49 actually, and one state, uh, Hawaii. Um, which has been incredible. That just happened recently. Throughout history, the only force that has overcome uh, such inertia and resistance uh, is courageous public values-based leadership for compassion, for love, for justice. Whether in the liberation of India from colonial rule, the US civil rights movement, the end of uh, South Africa's apartheid regime, religious people, have always played a very critical and pivotal role uh, in such movements. And that's why I'm so excited about the over a thousand faith leaders and counting who have already come together to join the call for a fossil fuel treaty. We know uh, the science surrounding is urgent. Um, what is, uh, 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 what, will, what will change and give our politicians the courage to act here at Stockholm Plus 50 and beyond is a call that they can't ignore. And, and the fossil fuel treaty, it is bold. Some people say to me, it's, it's too big, it's too new. Uh, at this moment in history, we need to be bold. At this moment in history, we need new ideas because we can't afford more of the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sephora. That was really inspiring. Um, next, we are going to be watching a short video, but before uh, we do, can I just remind everybody, if you do have a question, please pop it in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. We're now going to watch a short video with speakers, including Svetlana Romanko, 
from Stand With Ukraine, who until recently has been working as the Zero Fossil Fuels Campaign Manager for Laudato Si. And I think James is going to be sharing his screen, so we watch that video. Russian missiles are destroying our cities, killing civilians, children. As a mom, sister, and daughter, my world is falling apart around me. We must stop this war machine, restore peace, and end this egregious aggression. Fossil fuels are the main cause of climate change, which, like war, threatens everyone around the globe. Yet there is something we all can do to make a difference in this horrific war. Thank you, Dominica. Our next speaker for this evening is Reverend Dr. Rachel Mash. Rachel is the environmental coordinator of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, which includes South Africa, Swaziland, Eswatini, Lesotho and Namibia. She works with the Green Anglicans Youth Movement, which is taking off in Africa, and she is the secretary to the Anglican Communion Environmental Network. Rachel is also on the steering committee for the season of creation. Rachel, over to you. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be able to join you from um, Cape Town in South Africa. I just want to check that you're able to see my screen. Wonderful. So I, I want to talk about oil in Africa, and I want to start back in history and um, going back to 1884 at the Conference of Berlin, when seven Western European nations sat down and decided on how they were going to partition up most of Africa for invasion, annexation, division and colonization, the Conference of Berlin. It was called the Scramble for Africa. And the reality is that now we are facing a second Scramble for Africa. The reality is that with the price of Middle Eastern crude oil skyrocketing and advanced technologies such as fracking and other technologies, now the reserves in Africa are easier to tap and the region is becoming the scene of a competition between major powers that recalls the 19th century scramble for colonization. We have moved into a new colonial period. And with the war in Ukraine, is Africa now going to become the gas station for Europe? Many producers may benefit from Europe's scramble for non-Russian oil and gas, but the reality is unlikely to match the hype. But eyes are turning to Africa and looking for new fossil fuel developments. Across Africa, oil is known as the oil curse. It's a shorthand expression which describes all dependent countries, such as Angola, Nigeria, and many. And it refers to a series of dysfunctions, economic, political, governmental, and security. Oil-dependent countries suffer from limited economic diversification, vulnerability to price shocks, decay in their manufacturing and agricultural sectors, declining terms of trade, misguided economic policies, and a fundamental neglect of human capital. Economically, these states have tended to neglect their human development because they are blinded by their resource wealth, which transforms them into oil rentier economies. But in addition to these economic effects, African oil states also suffer from global patterns of domination and dependence, in some cases, neocolonialism, 
in all cases, multinational corporate exploitation. I want to tell you about one project, and I'm focusing on Canada because it's one of the big five. A Canadian pop-up oil company, Recon Africa, has started drilling in the Kavango Basin in Namibia, and Namibia is in southwest Africa. Bishop Luke Pato alerted us that Recon Africa had already started exploratory drilling in the Kavango Basin, unknown to the majority of the Namibian people and under COVID of COVID. The Kavango Basin is the feeder area for the Okavango Delta. And you can see that the huge area there in orange, which was the area that was licensed for petroleum exploration, the proposed oil drilling in red dots and the approved oil drilling. Now, this is where the, the rivers and the streams flow down into the Okavango Delta. What had happened? There had been a total lack of participatory process. The public did not know. And when the Namibian Sun, the, the newspaper of Namibia, broke the story, they were threatened with being sued by Recon Africa. There was huge abuse of the indigenous rights of the Sun people and rural communities as they were pushed off their land. The reality is for most rural people, they do not have a piece of paper to say that they have rights to the land. And they're often pushed off for the sake of a bribe of perhaps the, the governor in the area. There's a huge danger of pollution of water in a very dry country. Namibia is the driest country south of the Sahara. A danger of pollution of the Okavango Basin, which is one of the seven natural wonders of Africa and provides water for four countries in that area. And of course, the climate change impacts of a new oil field, a potential carbon bomb. So the issue was brought to the bishops of Southern Africa, Namibia, South Africa, Lesotho, Mozambique and Angola, and they signed a petition. We also invited the archbishops from Canada to sign, and it was handed over at the Namibian consulate in Cape Town. The petition went online. And what was very fascinating at that point is because the South African and Namibian press were afraid of being sued by Recon Africa, they hadn't really run the story. But now that the bishops' um, campaign had gone live, they were able to report on the bishops, the so-called bishop story without fear of being sued. And a lot of press was covered. There was international activism. The Interfaith Kairos Canada also got involved and handed over the petition in Vancouver to Recon Africa's headquarters. And Extension Rebellion Vancouver held a protest on World Water Day. Ongoing media and social media raised awareness and Bishop Luke was interviewed by CNN. We used so social media from Green Anglicans and others to amplify the voices of the Namibian activists, in particular the people who had been thrown off their land. Now the entire situation is well covered. Um, National Geographic did a series on it and Leonardo DiCaprio and Prince Harry retweeted. So now people know and the eyes are on what is happening in the Okavango. The abuses of local people, the exploration which is taking place um, without proper environmental impacts. At the same time in South Africa, we are being faced with Shell <clears throat> who are wanting to do seismic blasting. I have never seen such a huge um, up, uprising by civil society from across the board, from faith communities, from small scale fishers, from the tourism industry. People were boycotting Shell, refusing to buy, standing outside the petrol stations. It was an, the, the biggest up, um, civil society uprising that I've seen. And they managed to halt the seismic blasting. But currently, Shell are back in court, and we should hear in the next two days whether or not they will be stopped. The seismic blasting was going to be out at sea and impacting very heavily on marine life, on the fishing communities. At the same time, in northern Mozambique, Total have gone into the area called Cabo Del Delgado, and they have caused to, there to be 750,000 internally displaced people. What happened? It's the same story. Total came in, they flew in all their international consultants, lots of money going to the politicians in the capital city over 2,000 kilometers away, no jobs for the local people. 
the local people were pushed off away the, the land where they have their smallholder farms. They were told to move away from the coast where they were fishing and no jobs. So the young men began to join Al Shabab um, terrorist organization and they had a terror campaign. Um, they started off by killing the oil workers, killing the government workers, beheading them, leaving them in the street. Young children as young as 12 were beheaded. And the people were so terrified that they have fled the area and they fled, they've gone down to cities like Pemba. Um, Total stopped for a while and then they got the armies from Sadiq to come in and they're trying to start again. But across Africa, it is the same story, abuse of rural people, environmental degradation, violence and instability. And so the Anglican bishops called for an immediate halt to gas and oil exploration in Africa. We have seen that oil is a curse and we have seen that not only are there the climate change impacts, but there are huge impacts on the people. The profit goes out of the country. It is a new neo-colonialism. The royalties for Recon Africa in Namibia were going to be 90% going to the Canadian company, 10% to Namibia. And of that, only a tiny percentage would go to the area of the impacted people. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says this. I call heaven and earth as witnesses that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. It is time for us to choose life so that we and our descendants may live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Our next speaker for this evening is Pastor Ray Minicum. Pastor Ray is an Australian Indigenous Anglican pastor and executive member of the Indigenous Peoples Organisation. He is a descendant of the Kabi Kabi Nation and the Gurren Gurren Nation of South East Queensland. As a pastor and educator, Ray's current work includes roles as Honorary Indigenous Minister for the Scarred Tree Indigenous Ministries. Pastor Ray has a BA in Theology from Murdoch University in Western Australia. At Murdoch, Ray helped establish the Aboriginal Educational Unit and Graduate Degree Programme in Aborig Aboriginal Studies, as well as the Aboriginal Employment Strategy for Murdoch University and the first Veterinary Studies for Aboriginal People. Ray, if I can pass over to you, which I believe is a video that James is sharing. Just one moment. Okay, can you see this? Great. G'day. My name is Pastor Ray Minicon, and I'm from the Kabi Kabi people here on my father's side, and Gurang Gurang people on my mother's side two beautiful tribes of the Australian Aboriginal people here. We also represent one of the oldest surviving cultures on the planet. We're still alive, we're still here, and we're still trying to figure out how we can make our contribution to the world around us. We've looked after our country for the past 60,000 years in collaboration with, in cooperation with, in partnership with our Creator, we looked after the land, and the land looked after us. But in these last 250 odd years, we've faced the most brutal assault on our culture, our people, and our land. And it's now produced one of the most serious crises that not only we face as Indigenous peoples, but we as the globe face all human beings on this planet face, and we have broken our connection with our Creator. That is serious. Those two serious things have produced this incredible crisis that we're facing right now. And now we're asking the faith community 
And I'm asking you as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, as a fellow Christian, to listen carefully and clearly to the voices of the indigenous peoples and those who are advocating in this climate crisis for us to change our attitudes, to change our behaviours, to even change the ways in which we think and pray and worship our Creator. We're asking you to make those changes quickly and swiftly because we don't have much time to turn around the incredible damage that we have done to our land and to that creation that God has given us that we are supposed to be responsible for, to steward and to take care of. We have failed him. and We need to stop failing him and turn around and cooperatively work together to change the ways in which we live, work, pray and fellowship together. So I'm asking you, as an Indigenous person who also, for all other Indigenous peoples, were at the forefront of the climate crisis, we still live in our country and we've seen the destruction of our land, our waterways, our rivers, our oceans, our mountains. All of these things are very sacred and important to us. But with those destructions goes the ways in which our lifestyle and our culture has been completely, brutally annihilated. And now we're looking to you. We're seeking you. We're asking you. We're actually pleading with you to take action now in this climate crisis. And to remember what the Word of God says. You know, Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the cosmos, not just you as an individual, but his whole creation. God so loved the cosmos that he would send his son to die for the cosmos, for all of us, so that we can live together in peaceful relationships with each other, with our land, and also with our creator. Look, we can do this. And so I'm asking you, as followers of Jesus, to make these decisions quickly and to make them carefully and to make them swiftly, not just for the, for the sake of your own self, but for the sake of the planet, for our communities and for all humankind. For God so loved the world that he gave. I'm asking you now that you also will give all that you have in order to save our planet from total destruction. Thank you. Thank you, James, for sharing that. And thank you, Pastor Ray, for sending it through. Pastor Ray will be joining us for the panel. So if you have any questions for them for him, please do pop them in the Q&A box. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the evening, Reverend Abby Mohawk. Reverend Abby is the Green Faiths Director of Education and Training. Abby is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in the USA. She's previously coordinated Green Faiths and Drew Theological School's Green Seminary Initiative. She coordinates Green Faiths relationships with semin seminaries across the US. And she also holds masters, a Master's of Divinity and a Master's of Theology degrees from McCormick Theological Seminary. She's also a PhD candidate at Drew Theological School. Abby has been a leader of the campaign for the Presbyter Presbyterian Church in the USA to divest, which she is going to share more with us now. Thanks so much. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> and just tell a little bit of our story. So I'm going to briefly tell the story of divestment and Fossil Free Peace USA, um, the Presbyterian Church USA, and how Presbyterians have been organizing for the last decade to divest from fossil fuels. We've done that in partnership with so many um, communities that are on the front lines. Um, and it's been a privilege to do that as part of my work at Green Faith, which is an international interfaith environmental nonprofit that has coordinated with people of faith around the world around divestment. 
um, for, for many years and including many of the people who you've already heard from today. So just as we begin, I wanna invite you to, to think about where you have experienced climate change in your life. When we started this conversation in the Presbyterian Church USA almost 10 years ago, when I asked this question of our denomination and, and faithful people in our denomination, people could say they had not yet experienced climate change in their life. And now I ask this question of all of us and of Presbyterians every day. And more and more people have an answer. As Bill and others have said, climate change is getting worse. We have less and less time to respond. There's more flooding, more forest fires, more drought. And my own journey includes um, migrating now twice across the country because of climate change issues. Um, about 10 years ago, when we started the divestment from fossil fuels movement in the Presbyterian Church, I lived on the coast of Northern California. This, this is my beach, um, and um, this is the ocean. And um, this ocean um, comes right up to the highway, a highway that will have to be moved um, in my lifetime. Um, and it will require the entire village that sits on this ocean um, floor, um, this ocean coast um, to also move. Um, and I think there are still so many people in the United States who think that kind of village moving is what will happen elsewhere. But more and more, it's clear that it will happen here. So this is California. And um, not only is there rising tides, but there's also um, rising um, and more often forest fires. And so from there, I moved to Texas to live on a farm um, and um, in, in, rural, in rural North Texas. And that's the picture on the right. And um, about a year ago um, was um, advised by our pediatrician to move out of Texas and to move back north to a climate resilient city um, in Illinois um, to protect our child who um, was no longer going to be able to survive um, over 100 degree Fahrenheit weather on a regular basis, which is now the norm in northern Texas. So we've moved twice now um, to escape climate, climate change. And so that question has become, where do you experience climate change in your life, has become one of the guiding questions for me as a climate justice um, activist. This other question, which I'll just touch on very quickly because we've heard from so many frontline communities already, is um, how we're moved as a church by frontline communities and people who are experiencing um, climate injustice and climate change already. But we're also moved by theologies of care and theologies of justice. In my own research as a PhD student, um, tracking how um, fossil fuels and the Presbyterian church um, and divestment interact, um, one of the assumptions that I made was that people were engaged in divestment from fossil fuels work, um, primarily from a place of um, trying to live out what Janet what the Genesis story calls us to do, to love God, to love each other, to love creation with our whole selves. And what is actually happening in, happening in the PCUSA is that that is an undercurrent of what the movement is doing. Um, it's an undercurrent um, under how um, people who have had a lot of historic um, financial and racial power in the US um, are trying to re, um, revision how that power is used. Um, and that comes under theologies of justice, trying to understand how God calls us to care for people who have been um, marginalized and, and left behind. 
So the Presbyterian Church is meeting this summer um, in just a few weeks, actually, to vote on divestment from fossil fuels. And um, this is a very nerdy photo of how the Presbyterian Church organizes all of its um, uh, business. And when they do that, they'll be looking at 11 uh, different um, pieces of legislation in our um, in our church body to talk about divestment and, and climate justice, um, all the way from having a tree fund to support offsetting um, and then starting the process to divest from fossil fuels and, and then through to affirming the Paris Agreement and, and full divestment from fossil fuels. Um, and this is the first year that we believe the Presbyterian Church will in fact support divestment. And when they do that, they will support um, divestment from five companies first as a, a way forward through the rest of the, the industry. This is just a brief history of where we've been in our movement that in 2014, we um, sent the first piece of legislation to General Assembly and um, it has had the most support of any piece of legislation in the history of the Presbyterian Church, um, grassroots wise, and then it gets stuck um, in the legislative body. Um, but for the first time ever, it has both um, grassroots and grass tops um, support until so we believe that it will pass this year. And all of that is to say that we um, are living into a vision of who we're meant to be in the Presbyterian Church this year um, to organize at General Assembly for divestment from fossil fuels, to do that in response to um, many of the calls for um, faithfulness, like uh, what Reverend Ray has talked about and Reverend Rachel, um, and, and to do that in a way that um, lives out gospel and, and faithful values of love and justice and care. And so that's what I wanna share uh, about the Presbyterian movement um, for divestment from fossil fuels today. Um, and I ask for your prayers as we prepare for the, the vote, which will happen in three weeks. Um, may we be bold and brave in our witness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Abby. That was brilliant. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for this evening, James Buchanan. James is the Bright Now Campaign Director at Operation NOAA, where he has worked since 2016. Having previously worked at Christian Aid, CAFOD and the Church of England, where he coordinated the pil pilgrimage to Paris ahead of the UN climate talks in 2015. The Bright Now Campaign calls on UK churches to divest from fossil fuels, invest in climate solutions and for the Church of England to manage its land more sustainably. James, over to you. Thank you, Tash, and um, thank you all for, um, for joining this evening. Great to see so many of you here. So I'm going to share my screen and I hope you will be able to see this okay. Okay, so I hope you can see this all right. Um, so um, yeah, I, uh, as Tash said, I, I work for Operation Noah, which is a Christian climate charity here in the UK, um, which works with the church to inspire action on the climate crisis. And I'd really like to start by saying that here in the UK, many churches have been at the forefront of um, action to challenge the fossil fuel in industry um, and to take action on the climate crisis. Uh, so I really wanted to say, first of all, thank you to, to all of you who've been campaigning on this issue um, with your churches, with your faith groups, and in some cases having done that for many years now. In this photo, you can see Ivy Bridge Methodist Church, which was the first local Methodist church to divest from fossil fuel companies in late 2019. And when the Central Finance Board of the Methodist Church, which has more than a billion pounds of assets under management, divested from fossil fuel companies last year, um, its chief executive officer, David Palmer, said, the patience of the church has run out. The Methodist Church had been engaging with oil and gas companies for many years and decided that they were not seeing any meaningful change or progress from those companies in aligning with the Paris Agreement. And so they announced their divestment, they joined um, the global divestment announcement for faith institutions last year, which was the largest ever 
um, divestment announcement by faith institutions ahead of COP26, when 72 faith institutions, including 37 from the UK, announced their divestment. Yeah, despite warm words from the UK government, um, especially ahead of COP26, um, which took place in Glasgow last November, um, as Sapporo has said, and as the Fossil Fueled 5 report demonstrates, there's been a really big gap between rhetoric and action on the climate crisis from our government. And all of the major oil and gas companies have plans to develop new fossil fuel reserves, despite the International Energy Agency and the United Nations saying that there can be no new fossil fuel projects if we're to limit global heating to one and a half degrees. And the UK government has encouraged this and has in fact also celebrated new fossil fuel developments. Last month, um, Global Witness and Oil Change International published a report showing that 20 oil and gas companies are planning to spend nearly $1 trillion on fossil fuel, new fossil fuel developments leading up to 2030. And many of these are companies that the Church of England and the Catholic Church in England and Wales are still investing in. For example, ExxonMobil, which is planning to spend $83 billion uh, on new fossil fuel projects. Total, $62 billion. Shell, $46 billion. And BP, $30 billion on new oil and gas projects. A few days ago, the UK government uh, announced that it would levy a windfall tax on oil and gas companies but at the same time, it's decided to subsidize new fossil fuel developments by offering tax breaks to oil and gas companies investing in new fossil fuel projects. This is not only illogical from the point of view of um, taking action on the climate crisis, it's also deeply irresponsible at a time when we need to accelerate the transition to clean energy. And when analysis published today shows that this subsidy could instead have insulated 2 million homes and supported many people in our society who are struggling with the current cost of living crisis. But Operation No, we've been working with campaigners and church leaders to call for action on these issues. And in March, more than 500 church leaders, including 68 Anglican and Catholic bishops, signed a letter to the Prime Minister and Chancellor calling for no new fossil fuel developments, support for renewable energy, and for energy efficiency measures to reduce heating bills. And we also supported members of the Church of Scotland General Assembly last week, where motions were passed supporting the windfall tax and also calling for no fossil fuel development. So it's been really great to see churches again speaking out on these issues. Most UK churches now have divested from fossil fuel companies, as you can see from this, um, from this graphic. Um, and yet the Church of England and the Catholic Church in England and Wales continue to invest tens of millions of pounds in fossil fuel companies. However, the tide is starting to turn, as you can see, um, nine out of 22 Catholic dioceses in England and Wales and 10 out of 42 diocese, Church of England dioceses have now announced their divestment from fossil fuel companies. The Church Commissioners, which is one of the three Church of England national investing bodies, are still investing in ExxonMobil. Um, and in February this year, 136 Church of England clergy, including the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, called for the Church of England to divest from Exxon. But they've continued to invest in Exxon in spite of um, having uh, put Exxon on a list of companies which are restricted for investment, which seems slightly bizarre, I have to say. The Church of England international investing bodies have also continued investing in Total, Total Energies, as they like to be called these days, um, French oil company. And that's in spite of the national investing bodies having sent a letter to Total saying that they would reconsider their shareholding in Total if they did not exit from Russia. And Total has said since then that it will continue to buy Russian gas. And yet the Church of England is continuing to invest in Total. So how can the Church of England's engagement with these oil and gas companies possibly be taken seriously when they do not follow through on the threat of divestment? Last week, um, uh, we joined campaigners um, from Young Christian Climate Network and uh, Christian Climate Action at a vigil outside Church House, which is Church of England HQ, uh, which called on the Church of England to divest from fossil fuel companies, and especially Exxon and Total. Just to give a quick snapshot, as I said, of where the, um, the Church of England and the Catholic Church are on divestment at the moment in terms of the diocese, 
So in the Church of England, 10 uh, dioceses have announced their divestment from fossil fuels. 17 dioceses don't actually hold fossil fuel investments at the moment, but haven't made a pledge not to invest in fossil fuel companies in the future. And so we're wanting to encourage those dioceses to publicly announce their divestment. And there are 15 dioceses that are still investing in fossil fuel companies. So if your diocese is either in the, the amber zone or the red zone, please do encourage your diocese, get in touch with us and um, encourage your diocese to, to divest, to make a divestment and a, a commitment. In the Catholic Church, as in many churches, young adults have been calling for church leaders um, to, to divest, calling for the church to divest from fossil fuel companies. Last, in the lead up to COP, 176 Catholic young adults wrote a letter to bishops calling for divestment. And here's where the Catholic Church is at the moment on divestment. Nearly half of the diocese have divested. We're up to nine out of 22. Um, but so there's still quite a few to go. So, so um, it's really, you know, the time has, has come and it's in many ways it's passed, um, but better now than never for the Catholic Church, for these dioceses to divest from fossil fuel companies. Of course, it's not just about divestment. We also need investment in renewable energy and energy efficiency and other climate solutions. And the International Energy Agency in the UN has said that investment in renewable energy needs to treble um, if we're going to limit global heating to one and a half degrees and reach net zero by 2050. So churches and faith groups, in the same way as they've been at the forefront of the divestment movement, we want them to be also at the forefront of investment in solutions to the climate crisis. Um, there's some really good examples of this already happening. And um, my colleague Sharon's going to put a link in the chat box where you can see Bishop Hugh Nelson talking about uh, the Diocese of Truro, which has invested two million pounds in, in renewable energy. And we're going to be increasingly working with churches on this area and we'll be publishing a report on church investment in climate solutions this autumn. So watch this space for more on that. Finally, I'd just uh, like to encourage you to consider whether your local church or diocese or faith institution could join the next global divestment announcement for faith institutions in July. This is a really powerful and prophetic step that can be taken by faith organisations at all levels to challenge the fossil fuel industry and to call for urgent action from our governments on the climate crisis and to put an end to new fossil fuel developments. So thank you all for joining and um, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Our final panellist for this evening is Rev Reverend Henrik Grepper. Henrik is an ordained minister in the Church of Sweden. He has worked at the National Office for the Church of Sweden since 2000 as Sustainable Development Officer. He has been a member of the European Christian Environmental Network Steering Committee since 2005 and the World Council of Churches Working Group on Climate Change since 2006. In, since 2017, he has been seconded to the World Council of Churches as Senior Advisor on Care for Creation, Sustainability and Climate Justice. Henrik, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, um, I think I'm not going to add so much more because we have heard all very, very interesting and important um, views on, on the fossil fuel business. For me, I mean, I come from a church that totally divested in 2014. So I'm I'm so frustrated over to still have to talk to churches about divestment. That should have been long ago done. So I'm I'm sorry that we have this conversation still. But also the non-proliferation is is the second part that I think is so important that we go for as faith communities. Because if we see this huge um injustice in, in how climate change is affecting people of the world and where do these um, emissions come from from people of the rich world i think the the thing from faith communities that we really have to fight is against greed and selfishness because very much of this is is pointing on our greed to keep on to a system that we know that we actually know is going to bring us to to a, a huge um, difficult situation. We know it, but our greed and our selfishness seem to take us to have good arguments to still be in that, in, in that uh, investing in those and also accepting um, new ex extraction of new fossil fuels. So we are in a climate emergency, in an in emergent situation, you don't put petrol on the fire. And this is exactly what we have seen over the last couple of weeks or months when, when we see the problem of not get, getting the, the fossil fuels from, from Russia and we have 
good arguments for not getting in. And instead of saying we will ramp up our, our um, um, renewable energy sources, instead we are looking for new uh, fossil fuel business. And I think that's from a faith community side, if we're act acting for climate justice, this is something that we really have to go against. And also to, to look into this is the situation for the transformation and the just transition that we are looking for. And this is this is the time to actually accelerate our investments in renewable and, and leave as soon as possible that we can from the fossil fuel uh, industry, because fossil fuels is also very much um, the, as Svetlana Romankov said in, in the video, is, is a weapon of mass destruction because the fossil fuel money goes to authoritarian dictators regimes over the world. And if we are going to, to, to have a more um, justice and equitable society in the future, we also have to build energy system that are, are not uh, building uh, huge capital to dictators or authoritarian regimes. So it's about democracy as well and freedom for others. So it's very much put your money where your mouth is. We as churches have been advocacy on climate justice for centuries. And at the same time, we cannot put money into the fossil fuel business if we have an advocacy on climate justice. So. To say it's complicated, no, it's not complicated. It's going to be much more complicated if we're not divesting, if we not leave the fossil fuel society behind us. And that is something that I think faith communities, our obligation is to serve people, to serve for justice, to serve for just transition. That is the, our voices to leave this, uh, this investment in that, this, that, that uh, company on fossil fuels. We have to do this because it's morally right to do it. So I, I pledge to all of you of different faith communities, wherever you are, look what, what, where is the pension funds? Where do, does the ch churches or, or the faith communities investments go? What banks do you have? Go to the banks and say, stop all your investment in fossil fuel industry, or we'll, we'll switch bank or something. Just, just come out with, it, with this, this message to say, we have to leave this and we have to leave it now because we have a very short time span to act on and we have to do it now. So please, um, maybe I was a bit too fired up for this because I am frustrated that it's not happening. What we all see must be happening. And I think faith communities, we have to take the flag and be in the forefront of this, this uh, exodus from the fossil fuel uh, fossil fuel country or globe that we live in into the renewable and more justice and more just future. We have to lead in that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henrik. We've now got an opportunity for a bit of a Q&A and that will go on till just five to seven. So we've got enough time for our calls to action and everybody can go home on time when I promised you would do. Um, so if you do have any questions, please pop them in that Q&A box and I'll try and get to as many as possible with the time that we've got. So first, brilliant conversation. If it fits, we'd love to hear some thoughts on the role of direct action to support both for the treaty and divestment as another way to embody our commitments. Thank you all for your leadership and example. And I think that's one's open to anybody who wants to jump in to answer. I'd be happy to, um, uh, uh, you know, speaking personally, because the treaty is a network. So it's a, a, a network of thousands of organizations. Um, so, I, you know, I think direct action and civil disobedience has to be a personal choice. Uh, and and I, I think that the fact that so many individuals from around the world, uh, faith leaders, uh, recently scientists are making that choice is a reflection of how serious the moment we're living in is. Uh, civil disobedience and direct action have been essential in social movements throughout history, in capturing attention, in forcing decision makers to respond. In part, I believe in showing people um, how serious the moment is 
if we're willing to stand up and block that pipeline or, you know, <laughs> glue yourself to the shell AGM as we recently saw and, you know, then, then I think the average person says, this is no normal activity, this is serious. And that's what we need to knock us out of our complacency. I've been arrested many times and, I, um, and I'll do it again, probably this year. And I don't like jail, nobody does. Um, but I think it's one tool uh, in our toolbox. And I think partially the fact that we are doing it and, and, and people see that, that we are willing to go to jail, that, it is, that that's how serious this moment in history is, uh, I think is uh, really important. Oh, I could share one personal thing with you, which is that after years of doing civil disobedience, I mean, at one point when I was 23, I was charged with 857 criminal counts of aiding and abetting because of uh, something that I had organized to stop logging in old growth forests. And so I've been in court and in jail a lot. Watching my son get arrested as part of the XR rebellion last year. Well, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Brilliant. Thank you, Zipporah. Hemrick, there is a question to you, which is how are faith groups uniquely positioned to encourage and produce change in our communities? Good question. Um, well, I think, and this is actually a, a quote from Gus Beth that rings in my mind that it says that he thought that the environmental problem was like biodiversity, climate change, and, um, and, and other things. And he said that he, he found out that, that it is just greed, selfishness, and apathy. And, and from a scientific view, that is hard to deal with. And for me, coming from faith communities, I think that the value-based movements of the world do, do must step up because we are, we are the ones to say this is right or this is wrong. Not just the economical values of everything to say we will have more money, their profit will be higher. Well, if, even if profit will be higher, it can be wrong. It's, so it's, it's very much from... From, from the faith communities to also to go in there and say we 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 are called for to treat this world and I, I'm trying to to be inclusive to all kind of religions we are here to 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 treat the world mother earth in the best way we are also here and many different religions they abstain from things like fasting and this is something that we have to learn also, especially in, in, a, in a world where profit is God, so to say. How do we abstain from things so others can have? And, and I think that is something that we as faith communities, we have a, a special role in this discussion. So for me, I think we, we are too silent on this. We are often very much close to power. Uh, and are win and not want to, to interfere with them or say something that could could make it problematic for us. But I think uh, the reason why we're here is very much to have this understanding of what is right and wrong. Um, the justice aspect, of course, is in every religion is also very important. And climate justice is not just something you say, it's, it's something that we really need for the future of, of this world. Thank you, Henrik. Pastor Ray, the next question is for you, which is, Christians tend to say God is in charge, don't worry about it. What are some strategies to get churches to embrace this topic as an essential part of their ministry? Wow. I think, first of all, one of the uh, most challenging and brutal doctrines that the church preaches is its eschatology. I think it's its eschatology that's putting the church to sleep, thinking that Jesus is going to come back tomorrow and he's going to fix it all up. And I think that is the major doctrine that somehow, uh, I don't know how, because I'm just a, you know, an, uh, an indigenous pastor, we, we hardly ever get hurt anyways, but we can see these issues so challengingly and the church is the sleeping giant. It has the capacity to turn this around uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a right way. 
But I think that that doctrine that Jesus is coming back has got to somehow be silenced in the church or put in its right perspective so that we can have a perhaps a much more uh, robust conversation about these issues around climate justice. That would be my one perspective. The other thing too is that uh, we should also come to the table and uh, perhaps put down uh, or do an exercise in saying, you know, what a, if you were the uh, prime minister or the minister for climate change in your country, what would be the 10 most important policy changes that you would do in order to make these things change? And the third thing I'd like to add is that sometimes it's not our politicians that we have to tackle and I think uh, Zabora is right it's not them it's the multinationals it's the power behind the throne it's those people like the, the gun lobby in the US it's not the politicians who can make these kind of changes because behind them is the plutocracy as well as the aristocracy as well as all the other uh, uh, despots who want to hold their power and control the ways in which policies are made. And sometimes I think we we we, we point our uh, energies at the wrong politician rather than the, the despots behind them and work out how we can make them change. But that would be my three little thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rachel, the next question is for you. The government of Guyana says the rich countries, which are high producers or extractors of fossil fuels, cannot tell a poorer country such as Guyana not to drill for oil. They say it's unfair to a poorer country needing income to meet needs for infrastructure, alleviating poverty, etc. How do we respond to that? No, they're totally right. I mean, that's why we have to talk about um, the just transition. You can't expect countries that have not benefited from um, fossil fuels to to now not develop at all. Um, we need we need the investments to go into other things. For instance, Namibia um, is just has just signed a contract for green hydrogen with a, a large, I think, German company. So so why does Guyana have to have gas and, or oil? Why can't they be producers of green hydrogen? Um, we need energy and we need jobs, and but there, there are more jobs would be created by, by renewable energy projects. But you can't expect the poor countries to come up with their own renewable energy projects. Um, they need massive in, in, um, investment. So yeah, the point is, is absolutely right. But countries need, if they're going to leapfrog over fossil fuels, then they get, they need massive investment in renewable projects. Brilliant, thank you so much. And we have just one minute left of Q and A's and I'm going to pop in a question myself um, for a quick fire answer, which is how do we get involved if we're part of a church, part of a faith institution? Um, for each of you, how do we get involved with what you're all doing? James, perhaps I jump in? In first. Yeah, happily will. I think um, I, I would start by looking at um, what's my sphere of influence? You know, is it your local church? Are you involved in your um, diocese? Or, you know, perhaps even for some people on this call, you know, if people are sort of members of decision-making bodies like the General Synod of the Church of England, for example, or, or other decision-making bodies, you could have a real influence there. So I think start off by looking, you know, what, where can I influence things? What, you know, where... Um, and I think inform yourself, first of all, um, um, get in touch with the organizations that have been on this call today and find out, you know, how can, um, you know, has my local church, has my local diocese divested from fossil fuels? If it hasn't, how can I get involved in supporting that? Um, that's one thing I'd, I'd recommend. 
Green Faith is in the process of doing um, our of launching our week of action in the in the fall, and that will include supporting the fossil fuel non proliferation treaty, um, and also divestment from fossil fuels work. And so, I'll just pop in the the chat the link to that um, launch call that we're starting next week, um, and it really melds um, action and faith um, and a just transition all together as we stand against the fossil fuel industry. Fantastic, thank you so much. I might have to ask other panelists right. if there's anything to get involved with, if you could pop it in the chat. We're overrunning and that is my fault this time. Um, but all of the links in that chat will be emailed out to everybody, I'm sure after this webinar as well. So all that information gets passed on. It's now time for our calls to action from Cameron Conant, part of Operation NOAA, and Zamara Acevado from the Lodato Sea Movement. If I could pass on to you both. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly share my screen and uh, follow up on what you were uh, just asking about, uh, uh, which is what can we do? What should people do? And James, James mentioned this. Uh, I'm Cameron with Operation Noah, so I'm naturally going to go right to uh, divestment, and I'm going to encourage you once again to join our global divestment announcement. You know, Pastor Ray said earlier, the church is a sleeping giant. Maybe you're on this call and you're tired of that. Well, this is a great way that you can be involved. And what I want to say is you don't have to have millions of pounds uh, of investments. You don't even need to have any investments in fossil fuels because your little church or your small faith community could, in an act of solidarity, vote whatever your however you vote on things as a community and and you could say we support fossil fuel divestment and we will not invest in fossil fuels in the future and you can get your name of your church or community on our uh, global divestment announcement or maybe you do have actual funds like abby was talking about in the presbyterian church that you can influence a big denomination to take its money out of fossil fuels uh, so we'd love to have you be a part of that announcement it's happening on the 5th of july we're doing it with our global partners, World Council of Churches, Green Anglicans, Green Faith, the Dato C, and uh, please be in touch with us if you'd like to be a part of that. Thank you so much. Fantastic, and Shamar, I think you are next. Thank you, uh, but, yeah, just let me, yeah, I think it's better now, uh, yeah. Well, good afternoon from this part of the world uh, yet. I'm Xiomara, I'm from the Laudato Si Movement. Um, I just wanted to provide you a quick update that is giving us some hope that the treaty and its initiative is going to be, it's going to have like the participative participation of many actors from the Catholic and the religious communities. It's very excited to share with you that we have so far just in the last two weeks, like 13 endorsements from Catholic organizations from Brazil, from Argentina, from Indonesia, and even one at the Latin American and Caribbean level, which is, you know, very, very exciting to see how the religious, the faith organizations are receiving the initiative of the treaty and are really willing and happy to join and endorse the initiative. Also, you know that we have the faith leaders that are reinforcing the necessity to drive climate change, um, especially through its three phases, like the end dispatchal of any fossil fuel project, also phase out the system production, and also ensuring the global transition that is just, that is ethical, that is fair for all communities, especially the ones that are the responsible for the climate crisis. And we also had a formal quote of the Vatican Dicatory from Father Joe Strong, who recognizes that the Fossil Fuel non proliferation Treaty is an initiative that is really addressing the current crisis that the world is facing, such as the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and also the peace and ecological crisis. So all these three actions, the Catholic endorsements, the faith leader, and the reception that it's having among the religious and among the faith leaders and communities and also this formal quote in our previous webinar is giving us hope that we are going to have the involvement of lots of religious um, 
faith leaders and faith communities and faith organizations, and also coming from the global south, which I think that is an added value for this initiative that necessarily need to put at the forefront the communities that are the less responsible for the climate crisis, also in accordance with our faith principles. So it's been amazing so far, and we will keep you updated. Of course, I want to invite everyone, all of you to endorse the faith later so we can promote the engagement of religious and faith communities in this treaty to drive the climate crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amara. And thank you everybody for attending. That brings our webinar to a close, unfortunately. We have run over by one minute, which is my fault. I do apologize. But thank you to all of our amazing speakers who have come to share such inspiring messages, such thought-provoking messages, and such, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm certainly leaving with a glimmer of hope in all of this that's going on. I'd also like to thank you for each and every one of you for joining us this evening. I hope that you have what you've heard has deepened your understanding of why divestment from fossil fuels, investment in climate solutions and a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty are so vital in the climate emergency. And that this is something very practical that our churches and faith institutions can do to make a difference. I'd also like to thank you our webinar sponsors, Operation NOAA, Laudato C, Green Anglicans, Green Faith, and the World Council of Churches for organizing this event. An email will be sent around to everybody um, who has signed up on Eventbrite with the key links and information. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you everybody for being a part of us, well, being a part of this webinar. And from me, I hope you all have a lovely evening, morning or rest of your day, wherever you are. Bye everyone.